chapter 4. Turn there with me as we continue going through our series on what is the gospel. Well, the word gospel means good news. And sometimes we Christians are guilty of a, of a lot of things, but not emphasizing there is good news. We looked at, uh, we won't have a PowerPoint for a while, so you're actually going to have to use your Bibles and uh, turn to Luke 4, and we're going to have to jump around. You're going to have to learn to Jump around. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. You have to learn to jump around. <laughs> I, I'm old enough to remember those, uh, let your fingers through the, do the walking. Remember those yellow pages? Luke chapter 4, we started four or five weeks ago, and we said the first thing about the gospel, that it's good news, that Jesus came uh, to bring good news to the poor. Now, really, he's not talking about the financial poor, because then that wouldn't be fair to the vast majority of people who are lower middle class, middle class, upper middle class. So he didn't really mean just people that are, are financially poor. He was talking about people that are poor in spirit. In other words, you feel like a reject. You feel like a loser. You've been lied to and told those things. You were an accident. Your mom and dad didn't want you from birth. You're not quite as sharp as other people. Maybe you don't quite have the looks and you're not as cool and, and you don't have the job and the car and all that stuff. You're, you're poor in spirit. There is good news for you. Jesus came to bring good news to the poor, the downtrodden. And then we looked at a few, several weeks ago that he came for the brokenhearted. If your heart is broken, as you realize your sins and the, and, and, and the cause and the effect, and, or if you're broken because of somebody has, has harmed you greatly and you feel wounded and hopeless and discouraged and depressed, there is hope for you. There's good news for you, Jesus is saying. And then, then in this next passage in Luke chapter 4, there in verse 18, he simply says this. He didn't come just for the brokenhearted, but there in that next verse, he simply says it this way. I have come to preach deliverance to the captives. If you're bound, if you're caught up in a sin, you don't have to stay there. You are not a product of your past that you're, you're destined to stay like that the rest of your life. 
that there is an answer out of the dilemma. There is an answer out of the quandary of the uh, of the uh, uh, that that jail sale that you're in. This week, I want us to look at the fourth part. There in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He the Father has anointed me, Jesus the Son, to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. And this week, we're looking at the fourth aspect of the gospel to to set, uh, excuse me, and recovery of sight to the what? And recovery of sight to the blind. Holy Spirit, we're listening. Make us tender in your sight. In Jesus' name, and all the people said. I've titled the message, Church, this morning, for those of you that are taking notes, Walking in Light, How Free Do You Want to Be? Walking in Light, How Free Do You Want to Be? Let's jump in and get started this morning. And and it's just a couple of verses is our whole message. Jesus has come to preach recovery of sight to the blind. Now, if you would read that quickly, you would think, oh, Jesus is talking about people that are what? physically blind, but if you've been reading your Bible enough, you can kind of say, okay, is he really talking about just blind people? And I would say no for a a couple of reasons that he's not referring to blind people. But if you were blind, ask God to heal you, but you can't take this text because this doesn't appear to be what he's saying. For, For a couple of reasons, number one is this, is that what percentage of blind people were in Israel at the time or, or throughout all of, you know, the known world? 50%? 50%? Well, no. 20%? No. Less than 1%? So why would Jesus have come to heal blind, but not people who have leprosy? So probably not referring to people that are physically blind. But we think about this. If you grew up in church, there's a song that you probably know. Even if you've never been to church, you probably know the song. Uh, I once was lost, but now I'm what? Okay, when you sa- sang that, when you said that hundreds of times over your life, were you, were you really f- lost? Now, if your husband's driving, ladies, you might be lost because husbands never asked for directions. But you weren't really, really physically lost. You were what? Spiritually lost. You didn't know your direction or your way in life. Okay, so you sang that, but you didn't mean that. And then you didn't just say, I once was lost, but now I'm found. You said, I what? I was what? Now, you said that a hundred times in your life. Did you mean you were physically blind? No, you meant you were blind to the ways of God. So... When we look at this passage, there's, if you're taking the notes in your outline, he could be re- referring to people that were physically blind, but more than likely, obviously, that's not what he's referring to, because throughout Scripture, we see blind as a metaphor, a blind as used as a word for people who are not able to see what God is doing. They're e- either able not to see God, period, and His grace, or they're simply blind to, to the sin or the trap that they're in. So, A, it's those who are physically blind. Who, what type of blindness is Jesus referring to in your outline? Well, He could be referring to those who are physically blind, but it doesn't appear that way. So there's two other options, and it's perhaps both of these are true. In your outline, it's all of mankind who are born spiritually blind. And that appears to be who Jesus is referring to. Because if you're talking about just blind people, he's only referring to half of 1%, maybe. <laughs> and he's not referring to everybody else as all kinds of illnesses and diseases and, you know, from leprosy on. So not referring uh, to, to a physical blindness, but he's referring to then all of mankind who are born spiritually blind. In other words, grace seems very weird until you experience it. Grace doesn't seem right. Fair is, well, you know what's fair to me is if I'm a good person, then when I die, I, I go to heaven. I mean, that's how I always thought before. And so I always compared myself with like Adolf Hitler and Genghis Khan. Man, I was pretty good. You know what I'm saying? Don't mess with me. You know what I'm saying? And so good is such a relative term, but until you get saved, grace, grace sounds so ridiculous. I remember I had a roommate in college and I had got saved, and I was all excited, and he'd come from a a church background that taught works, 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 works. And when I mentioned about getting saved, he said, that's a bunch of blankety blank, and he didn't use very wholesome words. You're telling me at the end of your life you can wait, and if you ask Jesus into your life that you're going to heaven? And I said, well, yeah, that's uh, it's not going to happen like you're saying. Nobody ever says, I'm going to live a party life for 85 years, and the day before I die, I'm going to give my life to Christ. Because at that point, your heart is hard. If you've been rejecting the grace of God for that long. But if a person really on the last day of their life, I've led many people to Christ during their last day or two or three of their lives. And if they asked Christ to come in their life, if they fully repented, they don't go to heaven junior. You know what I'm saying? All right, you got saved so late. All right, you got a romper room version of heaven. They go to the same heaven we all do. 
And you should be excited about that. We almost have an attitude of, you waited this late? Well, just for that, you're just going to have to hang around purgatory for a couple of billion years. No, grace really is grace. And until you get saved, grace just sounds weird. It's, it's an insult. How dare you say I'm not good enough? Well, I didn't say it. Jesus said it. <laughs> you're not good enough. Neither am I. We're sinners. We're not just bad people that need to get better. We're dead people that need to become alive in Christ. So here's the second thing I want to say to you. All of mankind, Jesus is referring to who are born spiritually blind. So until you come to know the Lord, grace is, is a foreign concept. It just seems so weird. You know, there's only two ways that the world teaches you can get saved. The world teaches works. Every religion on earth, from Hinduism to Islam, they all teach works. You, you go to heaven by being good enough. Jesus is the only person in history who said, absolutely not. <laughs> you don't go to heaven by being good enough. You go to heaven by grace through faith. And Jesus then provides that way if we trust what he did, not what we did. There, there is no other option of going to heaven. No other, nobody else on earth has taught a third option. Either it's being good enough and you can't. You can't be good enough. Or it's grace. Jesus was good enough. There is no second option. Here's the third option as far as who, the blindness that Jesus could be referring to. He's not just talking about to lost people. Everybody, we're all spiritually blind. We don't understand what it means to be right with God. We all sin. That blindness is that distance between God and I that, uh, that we can't see Him because of our sinful nature. C in your outline, I would say that C goes along with B. Blindness, Jesus is referring to, are Christians who are spiritually blind in an area of their life. In other words, when I got saved, I, don't, I didn't have every answer <laughs> to every decision I was going to face these last 30-something years. My eyes were open to God's grace and mercy that He would die for me, that He would love me enough to pay for my sins. He paid for it when He died. He shed His blood. Blood represents life. When Jesus gave His blood, He gave His life. It was an exchange that I could then turn in my sin and then I get covered by Jesus' life of perfection and grace and mercy. So when I got saved, I don't, I don't have all the answers in life. I still don't. But there are times in your life that you're not able to see God for different reasons. Sometimes just flat out disobedience. And so you're, you're blind to what God wants to do in your life. There is darkness in that area. And so I think Jesus is not just referring to getting saved. He's not referring to all of mankind who are born spiritually blind. But what type of uh, 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 deliverance, what, kind, what type of recovery of sight to the blind, I think is in your outline, Christians who are spiritually blind in an area of their life. That Jesus has come then to give you light in that area. Look at the word he uses, and recovery of sight to the blind. Well, we know what it means to cover something. It means to, to gloss over or to conceal. We know what it then means to, not just to cover, but to uncover then means to take it off, to, you know, re to reveal it instead of concealing it. But recovery of sight there in your Bible, that gives the idea of restoring back to what? What it originally was. Well, what was that? In Genesis chapter 3 and on, that in the beginning, God was with man and they were walking in the cool of the garden. That's how your father wants to walk with you. He wants a relationship with you. God wants to give you that sight, that awareness that God wants to walk with you every day of your life, that you're now making wise decisions on a daily basis. Let's jump in this morning, church, and I'm going to share with you four different ways that we can keep from walking in darkness, four different ways that we can keep. You're going to have to actually thumb around and jump around in your Bible and let your fingers do the walking. Here's a couple of scripture verses. 1 John 1, near the end of your Bible in Acts 7. 1 John 1, near the very end of your Bible before Revelation. And also I want you to turn to Acts 7. Four things that you and I can do to keep from walking in darkness darkness. See, if you're a true follower of Christ, you want to be like Jesus. That's what the word Christian means. Christian is Christ with an I-A-N at the end. Christian. That I-A-N means like. So Christian means like Christ. When the early church saw the Christians, they used to be called people of the way. Read the book of Acts. We were called people of the way. But when they saw the way, and Jesus is the way, the truth. They saw the way Christians were living there, said, those are little Christ. 
They are acting and living like little Christ. And so the name stuck. They started calling then us like Christ, little Christ, Christians. Look at 1 John chapter 1. Look at uh, verse 8. Just a little simple truth right here. And John had a way of telling the truth in a blunt way. John wasn't the, the kind of the sissy uh, preaching that we're uh, hearing in America. And I have to be careful because I'm one of them myself. But in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, if we say that we have, what? No sin in my life. We want, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Look at Acts chapter 7. Go there real quickly. And this is a guy by the name of Stephen. Now Stephen really loved the Lord. And uh, Stephen was not wimpy by any stretch of the imagination. And starting in about verse 51, um, Stephen is facing the most religious people, not just in his city, but in his nation, but perhaps in the whole world, because Israel was definitely the most religious nation on the face of the earth. They, they were, uh, they were uh, much more serious about their faith th than the other neighboring nations. So long story short, uh, the Holy Spirit has filled Stephen. And he is very upset with the, uh, the false religious leaders of his day. And he lets them know. And look, beginning of verse 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Now, how do you think that went over? How do you think the preacher said, hey, hey, Stephen, thanks, and I want to have you over to our church next week. Would you mind sharing that same message with them? <laughs> You're saying, well, Herb, he was out of line. He was out of line? How do we know? Which of, you, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? Verse 52. And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become betrayers and murderers. You guys murdered Jesus who received the law by direction of angels, and you've not kept it. When they heard these things, they were what? Furious or cut to the heart, and they were convicted, and they what? Mm. They gnashed their uh, with their teeth. But verse 55, but he, Stephen, what? Being full of, see, because sometimes the Spirit of God saying that's wicked and that's wrong, and that has to be confronted and de dealt with. And so Stephen was very bold to these people that had been keeping the church down, adding laws and laws and condemnation, and, and God was sick of that. He saw the burdens that people were carrying that they didn't need to carry. He saw that they were, they were financially ripping off the churches, and, and, and so the Spirit of God just rose up, and, and he's sharing these things. And, and just look at verse 55, but he being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, look, I see that the heavens are open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and what did they do? They stopped. That is almost a comical picture, that they really said what? Don't, we don't want to hear that truth. Look at that. That's a, that's, a, that's a powerful picture. And they cast him out of the city, verse 58. And they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man by the name of who? And we know that Saul became. And, and look, at, look at the love. Look at, look at the grace. See, you can be blunt and direct, but be full of love. Look what, look what Stephen did, verse 59. And as they stoned Stephen, as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus Christ, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, stick it to them and... Send them to hell. Right? No, what did he say? Lord, do not what? Don't charge this against, against them with this sin. And when, they, when he had said this, he what? So there's that dichotomy, that strange between having a hatred for sin but loving sinners. So, so what are we saying? How do, how do we walk in, in light? And how do we resist walking in the shadows in your outline, I want to say number one is this. Recognize and admit there are blind spots in your life. Recognize and admit there are blind spots in your life. That's going to be the first step. That's how you get saved. But after you get saved, you've got to recognize. Okay, how many of you all drive a vehicle at some point? Okay, now, If you drive a vehicle like a car, you have two ways to look behind you. You have your rear view mirror, but you also have your what? You have your side view mirror. Now... If you just look at your rear view mirror, that's good. Anybody ever been driving and you looked in your rear view mirror, didn't, you're going to make a lane change, didn't see anybody. You look to your right and then you look to your left, didn't see anybody. And then you got ready to make a turn and what happened? Switch lanes? 
a motorcycle because the rear view mirror looks right out your back window and your eyeballs look to the right or left, but there's called a, what kind of spot? A blind spot. It's right there on your back bumper, your left or right, where if you look to the right, you can't see it. I don't know, once or twice over the years, I've almost hit a vehicle, one, like a motorcycle. I just did. He was right in that perfect blind spot. In your life, you have a blind spot. You, know what, you want to know what it is? Ask your spouse. <laughs> you're going to hear from God. You're going to hear from the Holy Spirit more from your spouse than anybody else. You know why? They know you better than anybody else. Now, that doesn't mean, like, if your spouse says, I, I believe you're supposed to buy me a $100,000 Maserati, that's probably not the Lord. So it could be that sometimes your spouse is in the flesh, but oftentimes that blind spot is going to be revealed. The, you know the second kind of people that will always tell you your blind spot? Your enemies. Your enemies will tell you the truth about you. They might not say it in a nice way, and they don't care if you don't like them. Listen to the people real close to you and listen to your enemies because they're probably telling you the truth. How do we keep from walking in darkness in your outline? A, recognize and admit there are blind spots in your life. I was reading of this lady, young, uh, she finished high school, she went off to college, and she said, Dad, you need to tell me about a bank. You know, I need to put some money into our bank in this town. And, and he said, sweetheart, there's this so-and-so bank. It's, it's a real big bank. Start banking at this particular bank in your college town. So anyway, a couple of months later, the daughter calls the Daddy up and said, Daddy, you gave me bad counsel. Sweet, are we talking? You gave me bad financial advice. Honey, what did I do? Well, that bank you told me to start a bank account with, yes, said they're having all sorts of major financial problems. He said, Honey, that can't be. She said, It is. They sent me back a check and it said insufficient funds. See, when you're blind, you think other people are wrong. And you don't think it's you. How do we keep from walking in, in darkness? Admit, recognize it, first of all, and admit, in my life, there's a blind spot that unless somebody helps me, I will continue to stay confused in that area. Here's the second thing that I want to say to you. Look at, uh, look at Matthew 19 in your, in your Bible, and then look at Psalm 51. Look at Matthew 19. It's the rich young ruler. If you remember the story of the rich young ruler, how many of you love to walk in darkness and confusion? How many love to have minimal options and keep making bad choices? Raise your hand. Okay, good. I'm in the right church. Right church. All right, Matthew chapter 19. How do we stop from walking in darkness and in confusion? Look at Matthew 19. Look at about verse 16. And you know the story. It's a story of a guy who was rich. He was also young. He was also what? A ruler. He was rich, young, ruler. So rich, he had the bucks. He was young, looking good. Ruler in control. He was a boss. So this guy had it going for him. And I can see him in his uh, chariot. He had his uh, spoke, uh, fancy spoke wheels. You know what I'm saying? And he's, his horse was probably a low rider. He, you know what I'm saying? This dude was really, he was really cruising. Man. He had a low rider and, and he had his chariot and he was all that and a bag of fries. And, and he, he hears about this guy named Jesus. This guy is speaking like nobody we've ever heard in history. And so he says, I want to talk to this guy because I hear he talks about God and stuff like that. And there's something in my heart that recognizes there's something more to life than me. There's something more to life than eating, drinking, and, and, and just let's be merry. There's something. In, in every human being, you reach a point in your life where you say there's something more than what I'm experiencing. So this is what he does. Look at verse 16. Now behold, one came and said to him, good teacher, what good things shall I do that I may inherit eternal life. In other words, you either believe you're saved by grace or by works. And he says, what other good thing do I have to do? What other good work? And first of all, Jesus just quickly corrected him by saying, why do you call me good? In other words, there's no one good. See, Jesus is not, see, Je no, he's not, he's not saying that. He's saying either I'm God or I'm a sinner like everybody else, but no one is good. People are not good by nature. They're sinful by nature. So why do you call me good? I'm either God or I'm a sinner like you. I'm man. So quickly, Jesus dispels that. And then he goes this, okay, and by the way, the question that you're asking me, he says this, uh, but if you want to enter into life, rich young ruler, keep the commandments. You want to, you want to be saved? Then, then keep all the commandments. And I'll, he said to him, well, which ones? Hey, Jesus, so Jesus kind of flushes them out. Well, he, don't murder. In other words, don't get angry because you can't murder unless you're angry. 
You shall not commit adultery. Don't have improper thoughts towards the opposite sex. Right? Don't commit adultery. You, don't, you only do it in your heart before you do the action. It's impossible to commit the act without having first meditated on it. So he's, get, he's don't steal. You shall not bear false witness. Always tell the truth on everything. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 20, the young man said to him, all these things I have kept from what? Now, how's that for blind? Hey, Jesus, since I've been a little kid, I've obeyed every one of those commands you've told me. What do I still lack? Come on, Jesus, tell me something. And give me something really deep, you know, the deep things of God. <laughs> so Jesus, okay, 21. Then he said to him, if you want to be perfect, all right, you want to go to heaven, you got to be perfect. I want you to go and sell what you have, give it to the poor. Hey, I noticed as you passed me, rich young ruler, you passed a whole bunch of poor people. And I noticed that you've kind of been doing that over the weeks that I've been here in town. And I noticed that you probably aren't helping them, but you sure are going out to the nicest restaurants all the time. And you could have downsized that ex extremely uh, wealthy uh, horse and buggy show you had and helped other people out. So Jesus looks him up. He's God. He can sum up real quickly. He says to him, okay, I want you to have treasure in heaven as you give to the poor, and I want you to come and follow me. But when the young man heard that, he said, that's a great idea. I can't wait to do that. Is that what he did? What does it say? But when the young man heard that saying, he went away what? For he had what? Notice Jesus didn't say, oh, I'm sorry. Hey, would you come back? I've made it a little bit too difficult. Just put a tithe in. That's all you need to do. <laughs> no, he didn't. He let him walk away. He's not going to lower the standard. He said, if you want to be perfect, then follow the word of God perfectly. What's your other option? You know, grace through faith. Here's the second thing I want to say to you in your outline before you look at Psalm 51. How do we keep from walking in darkness? This is what's important to recognize. When he came asking Jesus for truth, how do I make it to heaven? He didn't really want to know the truth. He only wanted to know the truth if it fit his lifestyle. Listen to me very carefully. If what Jesus said fit and made him feel comfortable, he would have received it. But he didn't really want the truth. Do you really want the truth or do you want a church service on Sunday morning? Because you can have one and not the other. Psalm 51 verse 6 says, But you, Lord, desire truth in my inward parts. Not truth here, but truth here. Most people miss heaven by 12 inches, the distance from their head to their heart. They hear it here, but it never becomes here. In your outline, let, let me say this. How do we keep from walking in darkness? Want truth deep in your heart. Not sample. You're, I couldn't believe in the first service I asked this. I'm going to see if you guys are as backslidden as the first service. How many of you like gizzards and chicken liver? Li oh, my stars. Y'all can come to the altar and pray too. Y'all can get right with the Lord. Y'all like gizzards? See, most of us that have common sense, right, Don? Everybody say, man, y'all are, are backslidden or something. How can you like, you got to be from eastern Kentucky. The hills are backwood. You know what I'm saying? What's that, uh, what's that song by the Beverly Hillbillies? Uncle Jed say, move away from here. Do, 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 do. Some of you like gizzards. If you like gizzards, I'm, I'm going to lay hands on you. <laughs> but see, you proved my point. We didn't get together to discuss that. There's some, there's some people that even like gizzards, lizards, or whatever you call them. But a lot of people don't like truth. Because truth confronts you. Isn't this the season of Freddy Kroger or Kruger or whatever his name is? <laughs> Freddy Walmart or <laughs> Freddy, Freddy Win Dixie or whatever? And, and Jason the 15th, or I don't know the name. I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm out of touch. A lot of people are scared of those things, but a lot of most people, almost all people are afraid of the truth. Because see, we have, we have this idea of how we are. And when you tell me the truth, it shatters my version of what I want truth to be. You ever heard people that really think they can sing? And they sing like, um, oh, let me think, Mrs. Piggy maybe is a good word? Grover? You ever have met people like that? Uh, this is a true story. Many years ago when our worship leader stepped down, there was a guy that uh, 
when I heard him, you ever heard like have people scratch a chalkboard with their fingernails? He sang like that on a good day. And he asked about being the worship leader. And I almost burst out laughing because I thought he was kidding. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> See, somebody had to burst that poor guy's bubble. I don't even, I'm not even going to go that way. A blind spot occurs in your life when you're not walking close to the truth. And you have this vision of who you are that's not even close to what it is. David said, Lord, I want truth in my inward parts, Lord. I don't want it just in my head, but I really want to know truth, God. I really want to know. Let, let me share a story with you. You know, if you apply for a job and you don't get it, you can go around saying, well, they didn't hire me, throw out your whatever. They didn't hire me because I'm a half Mexican. Well, maybe that's not why they didn't hire me. Maybe they didn't hire me because I wasn't the best qualified. And why don't you just go and say, you know, I would like that position. That's something I desire. What could I do possibly to have that position one day? Man, see, if I'm a leader and I hear that, I'm going to work with that person. But you can throw out that, well, they didn't because, and you start throwing out all the excuses. Maybe God didn't want you to have that position. Is that possible? Maybe there's character flaws. Maybe there's not maturity. There's not experience. A friend of mine named Paul, Paul Washer, we were in seminary together and street ministry together. He was a missionary in Peru, Lima, Peru, for a decade or so, and he asked me to come spend some time, spend a couple of weeks with him way back. But he shared a story with me um, after I came back to the States he had a worship leader. Her name's not important, but Paul at the time was, I don't know, 26, 28, and single. And the worship leader, she also was young and single. She was from that area, Paul obviously from the States. And he told me that there was a couple of people in this small little mission church that he had just started for the first time in Lima. And uh, long story short, that a couple of people raised up in that church that he was going to use them in leadership. But one... And then the other just drifted away and they quit coming. And he was so discouraged because, man, you know, you've got a small church of 20, 30, 40, 50 people. You're all excited. i got this couple of people that can help me. Long story short, there was a third lady that had come to the church, really loved the Lord. She was, uh, I met her. She had a, just a beautiful spirit. She had cancer. She eventually died in the next year or two, really young, died in her mid-late 20s. But she had a pure heart, a beautiful, beautiful heart lady. And long story short, she then dropped out. And Paul couldn't figure out why she was coming. And so he went to talk to her and say, why are you not coming to our mission church anymore? She said, I was told by the worship leader that you didn't want me here. And then Paul found out that this worship leader who was single liked Paul. And so when anybody else was being raised up to get involved, guess what she would do? She'd eliminate the competition. See, you can be in church and be in leadership, still walk in darkness. Paul said, Herb, she's no longer here, no longer. In your selfishness and in your darkness, you'll hurt people. You would hurt the church. The church could have several more leaders that could come and assist and help people. But in your selfishness, you get into lying and deception. Do you want truth in a scripture verse that you can memorize and repeat, or do you want it in your heart? Because if it's not in your heart, my friend, it'll do you no good. The second thing, I, oh, I was pointing to the uh, The second thing is, <laughs> I think it's good. We might have to do without it for a year or so. Want truth deep in your heart. Here's the third thing, church, that I want, want to say to you. And that's found in 1 John. Remember we were in 1 John 1.8? Look at 1 John 1.7. 1 John 1.7. It says this, If we say that we have fellowship with him, Jesus, but we're what? Walking in darkness? What do we do? We lie and we don't practice the truth. So if we say we have fellowship with him, Jesus, but we're walking in darkness, we're lying and we're not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he, Jesus, is in the light, you know what you're going to have? Fellowship with other Christians. And the blood of Jesus then cleanses us from all our sin. The third thing that I want to say to you is this. Your kids, those, how many of us are parents here? Your kids will often obey you if you agree with them. In other words, if you say, eat your broccoli, man, I remember you try to hide it. You know what I'm saying? I try to hide it under something, you know what I'm saying? Or grab it, you know what I'm saying? Throw it while mom wasn't looking. 
I said, oh, I'm going to play for the Texas Longhorns. Get a little pee or carrot, try to hit a trash can. Your kids will often, if it's something that they don't want to do, they will struggle, and oftentimes they will try to not do it. With curfew, whatever kind of music or movies they can or cannot watch. But if you ask them to eat ice cream, listen to me, they're not eating ice cream because you've asked them to do it. They're eating ice cream because they want to do it. This is an important point. Listen to what I'm saying here. They're not pleasing you necessarily or honoring you or obeying you. They're pleasing themselves. And by doing that, it feigns as if they're really obedient, but they're obedient because it fit their schedule. And if you're only doing the parts, like, and I want to do this and that, I want to come worship, throw my hands up, but I don't want to forgive somebody that hurt me, then what you're saying is, I only want to do the parts that make me feel good. But you'll never feel good when you walk in darkness. I know I've shared it before, probably a year or two ago, but I don't care, I'm going to share it again. It goes with this passage. Here's point number C in your outline. I'm going to share this story again. I don't care. Don't just want the truth. Apply God's truth. Listen to me, even if it hurts. Don't just want the truth, but to walk in light, apply God's truth. Listen, truth hurts. Listen to me. The vast majority of time, truth hurts. If, you've, if you had to say something to your spouse, did you try to say it in a nice way? Because you knew it was going to hurt them. It, it blows your, your self-image, what you thought, and truth normally hurts because as human beings, we got a lot of pride in us. But truth is necessary to walk in light. Way back in, when I was in college, let's see, I graduated from college 10 years ago. I'm 30 now? Okay, okay, I lied a little bit. Southwest Texas State University, I got out in 81. I was not a godly man there. I was not a Christian. I was a church member, but not a Christian. And we had learned through a friend of ours that had lost his meal ticket. Uh, now, remember this. This is 30, wow, 36 years ago. If you lost your meal ticket, like you could buy a 10, a 10 meal, 15 meal, 20 meal ticket, so you could eat you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner six days a week, plus Sunday breakfast and lunch and dinner. You had to eat out somewhere in the town. You could buy, and it was like a driver's license. They took a picture of you. The longest story short, one of our buddies lost his, and they gave him a paper one, because back then it's not like now where you can take a picture that can hand it to you and, you know, like at the driver's license in, in two minutes. And so longest story short, he then lost his, and they gave him a paper one, and one of us had the idea, hey, 15,000, 18,000 students here, when you go up to the person that's checking your meal ticket card, how do they know you're Bob Gavlick or Herb Williams? Well, they don't know. They don't know who people are. They just see a card. And one of us had the idea, at the beginning of the next semester, let's don't buy a meal ticket. Let's save some money. Let's one of us get a card and then say you lose it. They'll issue you a paper card. You then hand me the paper card, and I can go in and say, I'm Bill Johnson. I'm Bob Gavlick. The person would never know. You can save a whole lot of money when you think of how much a meal ticket is for a whole month. Longest story, Herb Williams was part of a crime syndicate. How to snatch food from a cafeteria. So I don't know, for two semesters or so, we did that. We would go and get a paper card, and it would be good for like two weeks worth. And after two weeks, another guy would lose his. And you could do that a whole semester. Long story short, I got saved the year after I graduated from college. And we were living in Fort Worth, Texas. My dad was down in Brownsville, like, I don't know, 500-mile drive or I can't remember what it is, 350, 400 miles. And so I had to pass through San Marcos. That's the college I attended. And this had come to mind many times over the months. And so as we were driving, I said, Joanne, I know this is not on our agenda, but I want to stop off at the college right here. This is San Marcos coming up. That's where I went to college, and I want to go to the cafeteria, and I want to speak to the management team. And I'd shared with her the story. So I pulled off and I went into the cafeteria and I said, I'd like to speak with the manager. She said, sure. She took me back there. And I said, sir, I was in college here eight or nine years ago. And uh, sir, I, uh, I stole meals. That's what it boils to. I could say, oh, you know what? You know, there's 10% of food that they don't eat at the end of the day that they throw away. See, you could justify all day. Oh, I'm just saving them the work of taking it out and throwing it away. That was nice of me. Now that I think about it, they didn't have to walk all the way to the dumpster. That was nice of me taking that food. See, you can play games all you want to. 
And I said, sir, I was in college here. And I explained the story. And I said, I have no idea how many meals I took. We can guesstimate two semesters, you know, 10, 15 meals per week. I said, let's come up with a price. I'll tack on interest and taxes. I said, let's come up with a workable figure. I said, sir, I've become a Christian. And I wasn't a Christian then. I said, I stole from you. And I want to make that right between you and this college here and between me and God. And he looked at me when I finished saying that. I said, I don't know how much this is going to be, but let's come up with a figure. Get your calculator out. Let's come up with a number. He looked at me. It seemed like 15 minutes, but it, it probably was more five or 10 seconds. But he just looked at me and looked at me. He said, you can, he said, that's fine. I appreciate that. You can go. And I said, oh, sir, you didn't understand me. And I started going. He said, no, you don't have to explain the whole thing again to me. I, I've heard what you said, and you don't have to pay anything. Go ahead and go. You know, when I walked out of that place, I thought, you know, I don't think he was a Christian. Because if he was, he probably would have said what? Hey, God bless you, brother. He would have made some. He would have probably, I could be wrong, but likely he wasn't. There was no reference to Jesus, God, I'm excited. Praise the Lord, man, God. There was nothing. But he just looked at me, wouldn't stop looking. I thought, Lord, what are you going to do in that man's life? Because if he's bad-mouthed Christians all of his life, you just shut his mouth there. If he was wondering, hey, you know what? I've seen hypocrisy in Christians and in church, but you know what? I've seen also a real deal. And when I walked out of that place, see, I didn't just hear truth, but I applied it. And I never was convicted again of what I did on that. Satan couldn't harass me and hound me anymore. Because I had just said, I'm sorry. I went to make things right through restitution. So what am I saying there in your outline? Don't just want truth, apply truth. Because if we're just a hearers only but not a doers, we deceive ourselves. See, truth is going to hurt you. Listen to me. Truth is going to hurt you. But let me tell you this. There's nobody walked out more free than I did when I walked out of that cafeteria. zippity doo da, zippity day. See, because I was cleansed and forgiven. Here's the last point, church, I want to make as we close this morning. See, if you want to walk in light, then walk in the light that God revealed to you. And the Spirit of God could convict me saying, get that right. And I don't know, and that guy might have been thinking of a lot of things, committing suicide or this or that or hardening his heart to where he was never open to God. And, and maybe God on that day at that hour said, go by because that witness will humble him and show him that I love him and that I change people's lives. Or maybe he was just a church member that was doing what I was doing but not a true born-again believer. Here's the last point, church, I want to make as we close this morning, that we walk in more of the light that God has set for us. Look at, look at that verse and then turn to Isaiah 60 and we'll close with this. Go back to Luke, the verse that we started off with this morning. I've come to bring recovery of sight to the blind. I've come to bring recovery. God wants the way it was at the very beginning when God created man. How many of you know that sometimes kids can be the most adorable kids when they're just a year old and do everything? You know what I'm saying? You, you tell them, say this, and they'll repeat it, and you just, man, you're, you just get tickled. But something happens during those teenage years, and I, that's, all I, that's all I need to say. They start thinking, you get, they start thinking as a parent, you're dumb. You know, and you know what the best thing to happen to teenagers is that they get their own job at their own place. Because all of a sudden, mom and dad get real smart. Was it Mark Twain who said, it's amazing how smart my dad got between the ages of 15 to 21. You know what I'm saying? Wow. When all of a sudden, they have to start paying their own bills and do this stuff. Dad's not so dumb. Mom's not so dumb and strict anymore. When they have their own kid, everything changes. To set at liberty those who are oppressed and recovery of sight to the blind. God wants to bring it back to how it should have been when you were first born, before you rebelled, before you thought God was dumb, that laws were, were silly, that God was trying to restrain, put a restraint on all your joy and happiness in life and rob you of joy. That's how God wants to restore your sight and understanding of what God wants for you. Look at that. Look at Isaiah 60. We'll close with this. How do we walk? How do we walk in, in this recovery of sight that, that he's referring to right here? Isaiah 60, it's, if you're new to your Bible, it's after Psalms and Proverbs, a little tiny book called Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. And there's a book called Isaiah, it's near the very end. 
And he says this, what a beautiful passage. Arise, verse 1, shine, for your light has come, Israel, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, yes, darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you, those of you that know Him and want to honor Him and seek Him. And His glory shall be seen upon you, the glory of God. The Gentiles shall come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. If you want to really walk in light and not walk in shadows and I'm not sure and always confused and always trapped, you just don't know what to do. God has provided light for you and light for you. Life when you get saved and then light. Isn't it, remember the old song? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God is not trying to play hide and go seek with you. He's not trying to hide his will. And see how good of a Columbo detective you are. God is saying, I want to show you where life and light is. But you're going to have to be willing to accept truth. There's two things I want to say to you. Then where do we find it? Right here. Listen, quit looking at this as a book of laws. If you're looking at this as a book of laws, I don't want one more law in my life. Jesus did not come to give you an extra hard commandment. He came to give you himself. Listen, he didn't come to give, oh man, we couldn't even keep the first 10. You think we're going to keep any more he's going to add? Quit looking at this as some legalistic book that's going to make it harder for you and weigh you down. How many of us are married? If you were married, did your spouse ever write you some cute little note, love letter, something like that? Right? Didn't you just love to read it? This is a love letter from God to you. And if you'll keep, quit looking at this as some sort of laws to straighten up your act and start saying, this is a letter of God trying to reveal His nature and character to me, of His great love for me. All of a sudden, you'll want to spend time. You won't be, oh, i got to check off. I don't want a quiet time. I want a quiet life. I want my whole life to be with God. I have to stop to talk to people, but right after I finish talking to them, I just enjoy talking with the Lord. In fact, if I go to the hospital for, don't come see me. I enjoy being alone with the Lord. Go see somebody else that's lost, that needs a visit. I want my whole life to be a quiet life, not a quiet time. Where if I have to talk to people, I'm, I'm encouraged. I can help them if they're lost, see Christ. If they're a Christian, help them grow. But then I love to just be in a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week prayer meeting with the Lord. This is where, see, there's not a whole lot of light on CNN or the presidential debate. But there's a whole lot of light right here. Let me give you one more truth. Proverbs says it this way in Scripture. It says that in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. In the multitude of counselors, there is safety. You want to make some wise decisions? Surround yourself with the light of God's people. Find a good group of people, three, five, seven, nine people, and meet with them on a weekly basis. Because you start becoming a lone ranger. See, the Christian life was never meant to be a lone ranger. This is a team function. That's why we're called the body of Christ. And when you start trying to go lone ranger, what you're saying is, I can do this Christian life on my own. You're blind. And it's just a matter of time before you make a very, very foolish decision. But when you're around other people who are filled with the light of Christ, they'll care enough to say something to you. They'll point it out. Remember that uh, TV commercial 15, 20 years ago? It was uh, for uh, alcohol. It says, friends don't let friends drive drunk. Well, I would say this regarding the body of Christ and walking in light. Christian friends don't let Christian friends live lost. Christian friends don't let lost friends live lost. Christian friends don't let their friends walk in shadows or darkness. Find some godly people to share your life with. Don't separate yourself from the body of Christ. As we close this morning, Jesus, I've come so that you could have recovery of sight. That means God is not trying to make it hard on you. He's trying to make it easy. He's saying, I'm not wanting you to see me as a, as a God of laws and rules. 
See me as somebody that loves you, that, that has your best interest in mind. Now, that truth might hurt you and what I'm asking you to do, but see me as somebody that wants to bless you. And all of a sudden, when you quit looking at laws and do's and I got to check my list and I spent quiet time with God, it changes your entire relationship. All of a sudden, you'll be able to see and make wiser decisions than you're making. Because I want to do this, not because I have to, but because it honors God and blesses Him. And he died on a cross for my sin. You're more real than the ground I'm standing on. You're more Yeah.